This will be the 31st uh, class in the series entitled Understanding God's Righteousness. In our previous class, we were addressing the limitations of God's forgiveness, and particularly if there are any unforgivable sins, particularly in reference to ourselves. And we looked at the first of two sin categories God defines as unforgivable. The first was the presumptuous sin, as opposed to a sin of ignorance, weakness, or foolishness. A presumptuous sin is one that either presumes an automatic forgiveness or simply dismisses the possible consequences for unforgiven sin as meaningless. We saw how that unforgivable sin category is identified as unforgivable in both the Old Testament during the First Kingdom Age and in the New Testament during the Ecclesial Age. There is a second category of unforgivable sin, but fortunately, we are not exposed to that potential sin at this particular time in God's plan. That should be quite a comfort, but sadly this issue has not been very well understood in our community for quite a while. Let's listen to how Jesus defines this unforgivable sin of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had just publicly healed a blind and dumb man. The man could see and speak. One would think this would be very impressive, quite validating for Jesus to be who he claimed to be, the Son of God, the promised Messiah that would save his people. But the Pharisees, that category of the enlightened, covenant-bound community, opposed many of the teachings of Jesus, presuming they couldn't possibly be wrong, such as his forbidding of divorce, uh, healing on the Sabbath, and letting his disciples pick and eat grain while walking through a grain field on a Sabbath day. Rather than consider that they might actually be wrong about these issues, these Christadelphians of that generation attempted to dismiss that validating capacity of the miracles of Jesus by claiming his power came from an evil, pagan god. We read of this in Matthew chapter 12. It says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Rather than reconsider their shared misconceptions about the terms of God's righteousness, these Pharisee brothers in the truth attempt to discredit the source of the miraculous healing power of Jesus by defining it as being sourced from a wicked, imaginary pagan god. Beelzebub. Christ's response is absolutely fascinating and highlights this unforgivable sin category. We drop down to verse 31. Jesus says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto man, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaks a word against the Son of Man it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, in this context, to define in the unmistakable, miraculous power of God being maligned as an evil force sourced from wickedness, Jesus warns about the unforgivable sin of blasphemy of God's Holy Spirit. A very defining feature of Christ's reference to this unforgivable sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit is the two time frames that he identifies. He says, neither in this world or the world to come. Now, the Greek word translated world here does not refer to the planet, as that Greek word would have been uh, cosmos. The Greek word translated as world, Jesus uses, is aeon, which means an age. 
Jesus says the sin of blaspheming against God's Holy Spirit will not be forgiven in that age in which he was speaking, nor in an age yet to come. This obviously indicates two separate ages when blaspheming or blasphemy of the Holy Spirit would be possible, which obviously requires a separating stage between those two ages when blaspheming, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will not even be possible. If there was no separation, then it would only be one age and not two. Very similar to the prophecies, uh, actually the related prophecies, about the early and the latter rains. You can't have an early and a latter rain without a period of no rain separating those two rain categories. Or it's just one continuous rain. Similarly, if there are two separate ages, then there will have to be a distinct period separating those two ages that is different than those two identified ages. So, what was that Holy Spirit blasphemy Jesus was referencing when he made this rather frightening declaration that there is a second category of unforgivable sin? These members of the enlightened community had witnessed the unveiled power of God that was used to relieve the suffering from the physical effects of sin. Now, not transgressional sin, but sin nature, for which no guilt is ever assigned. They declared that unveiled power of God to be filthy and disgusting, identifying it with the pagan god of the manure pile, as Beelzebub meant the Lord of the Flies, and was identified with disease. It's one thing to witness the veiled operations of God's Holy Spirit, as we certainly do, quite another level of accountability is assigned when that power is unveiled. Like the, like the cleaving of the Red Sea, the cleaving of the Jordan River, the cleaved fountain rock at Rephidim, those three resurrections back to mortality that Jesus performed for the son of the widow of Nain, the daughter of Jairus, Lazarus. These unveiled manifestations of God's great power impose an accountability that is far greater than just witnessing fulfilled prophecy like the Six-Day War back in 1967 and the political resurrection of the nation of Israel in their War of Independence over 70 years ago. The divine rule is to whom much is given, much will be required. The accountability before God of those who witness the unveiled miraculous power of the Holy Spirit is considerably greater than those who only see the veiled activities of the Holy Spirit, such as fulfilled prophecy and the, the natural order of creation, which is, of course, that spoken word of God. Witnessing the unveiled operation of God's Holy Spirit and defining it as evil and sourced from an imaginary pagan god created from the self-worshipping imaginations of the ungodly is a sin that God refuses to ever forgive. Not in that age, that transition from the first kingdom age into the ecclesial age, or in that age that Jesus says was yet to come, which will be the restoration of the kingdom of God, when God will end his prophesied period of silence, unveiling his power and his glory and the miraculous public displays of the Holy Spirit will abound. This understanding is confirmed in Mark's account. In Mark's parallel of the same account we read in, in chapter 3, um, picking up at verse 28, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies, wherewith whosoever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said he has an unclean spirit. It was witnessing the unveiled operations of God's Holy Spirit and calling it unclean and foul, that prompted the warning of Jesus about the unforgivable nature 
of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The unforgivable sin of Holy Spirit blasphemy is addressed, again, by Paul in Hebrews chapter 6. And Paul uses that same reference that Jesus did about those two separate ages. Now, this reference we're going to examine now is highly misunderstood by our community in general. Many teachers in our community have inappropriately diluted this warning into a complete contradiction of the terms of God's righteousness. We read this in Hebrews 6, picking up at verse 4, where he says, It's impossible, impossible, for those who were once enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, were made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world or age, aeon, to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. It's impossible to renew them again unto repentance. Why? Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. The terms for this unforgivable sin include enlightenment, tasting of the heavenly gift, which is also defined as partaking of the Holy Spirit, and the powers of the world, or again, more appropriately, the age to come. Paul references those same exact two age unforgiveness time frames as Jesus by noting two separate ages when this unforgivable sin could apply. The very oddly common but completely impossible understanding of this warning in, a, in our community for a long time now has been a dilution into nothing more than someone abandoning the truth. That's an absolutely impossible understanding as this completely and very directly contradicts the teachings of Jesus Christ. If it were an unforgivable sin to leave the truth, then it would be a sin for us to try to reclaim the lost lambs. It would have been absolutely wrong for the father to joyfully receive back the prodigal son. The suggestion that the unforgivable sin noted here in Hebrews 6 is simply leaving the brotherhood abandoning the social structure of brothers and sisters, is incredibly disrespectful to Christ's commands to reclaim the lost, to search, actively search for the one lost lamb that wandered off from the other 99. That false understanding would completely degrade the, pos the positive nature of ecclesial fellowship withdrawal from the intention of loving discipline into only a permanent ostracism without the option of return. These very incorrect explanations of this warning also contradict themselves by frequently then further insisting, well, that God can forgive anything in a fumbling attempt to accommodating the principle of reclaiming those that have been lost. So, what is actually unforgivable? since it can't possibly refer to simply leaving the truth to qualify as a lost lamb or a lost coin or a prodigal son. Again, the conditions indicate an enlightened believer who had been an actual partaker of the Holy Spirit, one who tasted the powers of the age yet to come. Therefore, one who could consciously direct the unveiled, miraculous power of God's Holy Spirit in one form or another. One could choose to use that miraculous power in whatever way they chose. They could use it to edify and glorify God, or they could use that power for self-glorification. And that's obvious in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians when he highlights how those brothers and sisters possessing miraculous gifts of the Spirit, those who had tasted the powers of the age to come, were inappropriately competing for self-glory in the ecclesial gatherings. 
We read this in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, verse 32, we'll pick up it. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And as in all the ecclesias of the saints, let your women keep silence in the ecclesias, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. Those who possessed one of the Holy Spirit gifts of miraculous power, those who tasted of the powers of the age to come, uh, were not constrained to only use God's power in exclusively appropriate ways. Sisters with the power to prophesy were supposed to be completely silent in ecclesial meetings, but were not doing so. Brothers were supposed to maintain silence while others exhibited their impressive power. Obviously, brothers and sisters could use these powers for self-glorification as opposed to glorifying God. We're also warned by Jesus that some of those in the truth who had performed Holy Spirit miracles will definitely be rejected at his judgment. <coughs> we read this in Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone, Jesus says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name have cast out devils? And in your name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. And now it's sometimes inappropriately suggested that this warning, well, can't refer to Christadelphians in the first century. That has to refer to the paganized Christian Christianity worshipers like the, like the Pentecostals. Well, that's impossible. That's an impossible understanding as they will not qualify for accountability to Christ's judgment. This actually refers to first century Christadelphians that tasted the powers of the age to, of that age and the age to come, but fell away, using their impressive, miraculous power for their own glory, and even to teach lies about God's righteousness. The spirits of the prophets were definitely subject to the prophets. It is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that qualifies as the second unforgivable sin category. But fortunately for our generation, we can't witness the unveiled power of God that imposes a far greater level of accountability due to God's rule that more is required of those who are given more. In reference to this reasoning, of the unveiling of God's glory imposing a greater accountability, let's consider that issue. After all, that's a component of our own judgment. To whom much is given, much will be required. Judgment is a variable set of standards, not exactly the same for everyone. So let's consider why that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was actually an unforgivable sin. Well, while murder and even idolatry and, and, as Jesus says, blasphemy against him can be forgiven by God. It is our Creator's policy to hide his glory. He manifests himself through various avenues and to variable degrees, including, including manifesting himself indirectly through angels and his Son, the faithful, but also the features and operating structure of creation, and of course, also the Bible. This veiling policy of the Creator serves a couple primary purposes. First, it's an act of mercy. If God revealed himself openly, we would not survive. Even Moses was not permitted to even witness the face of the angel representing God's glory, who was called the angel of God's presence. We read in Exodus 33, Moses' request, uh, verse 18, he said, I beseech you, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and will be gracious unto whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, You cannot see my face, for they can no man see me 
and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in a cliff of the rock, and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. And I will, make mine, I will take mine hand away, and you shall see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Now, we know this was an angel, as we're told us in Acts 7 by Stephen in the um, inspired text. Acts 7, 37 says, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, um, him shall you hear. This is he that was in the ecclesia in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Now, this uh, Isaiah identifies, it identifies this specific angel as the angel of God's presence. In Isaiah uh, 63, uh, verse 8, so, so we read, So he was their savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them in his love and in his pity. He redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. So the point is that even the face of the angel of God's presence could not be seen or one would die. The greater the exposure to God's righteousness and glory, the greater the accountability to that righteousness and the responsibility to respond to whatever degree of unveiled glory or one, one witnesses. Now, this veiling of God, his righteousness and his glory, is often underestimated in the enlightened community. The layering of God's veiling of his glory and the terms of his righteousness are often presumed to stop with any minimal baptismal level of enlightenment. Christadelphians frequently think scriptural answers are supposed to be simple, easy. Exactly the opposite is true. We've referenced this issue of an, a, a number of times before that God invariably communicates with an intentional complexity through both of his testimony avenues, his written word, his spoken word, the Bible and creation. This intentional complexity divine policy serves as a quality filter. Those within the enlightened community without uh, uncircumcised, uh, without circumcised hearts will not be able to see that greater measure of God's glory that is hidden within that intentionally complex testimony. Those who go through the very unpleasant, intense, and very humbling experience of circumcising their hearts before God will be able to develop those historically always rare seeing eyes and hearing ears that Jesus and Isaiah reference that will give more to those who already have while simultaneously taking away from those who have very little. That intentionally complex communication policy of God's is part of that layered veiling of God's glory and righteousness that we call God manifestation. The manifesting, the revealing, the unveiling of God, the substance, and not just the shadows. This is the plan of God, that he will be manifested in those who love him and choose him above all other pleasures and pursuits, those who love him more than family, more than the brotherhood, more than their neighbor, no matter the personal cost. This is the person in whom God can and will take his rest. So the reason why blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is defined as an unforgivable sin that could be an offense against God in that previous age and also in the next age is because God presents himself without that layered veiling process. His Holy Spirit power demonstrations impose a far greater level of accountability. 
There are certainly variable degrees of accountability before God. Uh, that's certainly referenced in the expression we've noted before, to whom much is given, much will be required. Another example would be the warning that James offers about not being too eager to be a teacher. We read in James 3 and verse 1, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. The Greek word translated masters simply means a teacher or an instructor. We're warned that teachers in the enlightened community will receive a greater condemnation. So we'd better be very careful. We had better be right when we teach about the terms of God's righteousness. This warning certainly defines a variable accountability. We're warned not to be too eager to be a teacher. But if we think it's, it's simply safer to be silent, which is so much easier and certainly socially safer, we have to balance that warning with another warning, and that would be Christ's parable of the unprofitable servant. He was given a single talent to use in his master's service. He wrapped it in a napkin and buried it in the dust, not even willing to deposit that talent in an interest-bearing account. Jesus called him a wicked and slothful servant, as safe and more socially pleasant as it may be to remain silent when one has been given a degree of enlightenment that qualifies one as a teacher that silence would be burying that talent in the dust. That dust that scripturally identifies the curse of death for failure. Because we are dust, and to dust we shall return. We don't have the freedom to invest our blessings in merely fleshly pursuits, represented in that judgment parable as dust. As always, there's a balance that has to be determined. It's certainly more dangerous to pursue the path of a teacher of God's testimony. But if we can offer value and choose not to, then we fail in that way also. There is no simple answer. So again, the reason why blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was and will again be an unforgivable sin is due to the greater accountability assigned due to the extreme unveiling of God in those public demonstrations of power through the Holy Spirit. We've also determined forgiveness is not automatic, that there are conditions for God's forgiveness, and that his forgiveness can definitely be withheld. The next two questions we're going to consider concerning forgiveness will be, do we have the right to ever withhold forgiveness from those who offend us? And secondly, or, or the next one, does the common phrase, well, if you haven't forgotten, then you haven't forgiven, offer any real legitimacy? I mean, is this an example that God offers? First, we should understand that this is another one of those conditions for qualifying for God's forgiveness. If we forgive each other or not, has a direct effect on whether or not God will be willing to forgive us or not. If we withhold forgiveness uh, for trespasses against ourselves, we can forfeit God's forgiveness for our trespasses against him. Peter asked a question of Jesus about the limit of personal forgiveness against those who sin or trespass against us. In um, Matthew 18, we read of the account, and Peter said to him, Peter came to him and said, Lord, Lord, how often? Shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto you until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought to him which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, 
saying, Pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, Oh, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you desired me. Shouldest not thou have also have had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? His Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So Peter's asking the same question that we're asking. Can we limit our forgiveness to for offenses, just to say seven times? Can we limit them at all? The master's response not only eliminates that offense forgiveness limit, but puts the question into the framework of our own salvation and participation in the kingdom. His conclusion was, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. This is also the condition that Jesus includes when he teaches his disciples to pray. We saw this in Matthew chapter 6, um, verse 7. He says, But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your, have, for your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. And this, after this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We ask that God will forgive our debts to him in accordance to the way we forgive those who are indebted to us. Therefore, if we withhold forgiveness for those who trespass against us, we jeopardize our own conditional forgiveness from God. This is exactly the issue Jesus immediately follows with after he provides this prayer structure. In the next two verses, Jesus says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your, have your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, we sometimes take side notes. And, and just as a side note, I, I wonder why some within our community have an entire ecclesia or a study group recite the Lord's Prayer together to start or conclude a Bible-based activity. I've seen this on a number of occasions. Jesus specifically says not to do this, to use repetitions in prayer, which makes those prayers vain, vain repetitions, because they are just plain repetitions without thought. Just like the Catholics, just like the Muslims, and just even like the Jews. Since the man who will judge us tells us not to do this, why is it still or have it ever been done? The theme of our considerations is understanding the righteousness of God. Why would we want to directly contradict very clear instructions from the Son of God in reference to what he declares to be wrong? Such a direct violation of Christ's terms of what is right is extremely confusing to me. Anyway, we have an opportunity to be like our Creator in this responsibility to forgive those who trespass against us, those who abuse us, lie about us, lie to us, intentionally degrade us and marginalize us, those who steal from us or physically harm us. As Peter says, they sin against us. Mankind lost that original image and likeness invested into Adam and Eve when everything 
back when everything was very good, to God anyway, before sin corrupted everything. Now, it's our committed goal to pursue that image and likeness of our Creator, to be like Him, to manifest Him. Therefore, it's our responsibility to forgive those who sin against us. But it's not our privilege or our responsibility to forgive those who sin against God. Jesus emphasizes this point about our responsibility to forgive others who have wronged us throughout his ministry to his disciples. In Mark chapter 11, we read, uh, Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. However, there is a huge difference between forgiving someone for trespasses against ourselves and forgiving sins against God. We do not have the authority to forgive sins against God. Jesus had that authority, and he proved it by exercising the power of the Holy Spirit. We read of one such account in Matthew chapter 9, where his uh, authority to forgive was questioned. Matthew 9, verse 2, And they, behold, they brought unto him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, probably could see it on their faces, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Your sins be forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. That unveiled demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit in offering a rest from the physical effects of the principle of sin, proved Jesus was given authority to forgive sins against God. Now, this authority to forgive sins against God was also given to the eleven and those, those that were with him, like the two that returned from Emmaus and such, when Jesus appeared to them during their evening meal on that first day of the week in that locked room, shortly after Sunday had begun, following the Sabbath sunset, and they were also invested with the Holy Spirit to those few in that locked room. We read in John chapter 20, starting at verse 19, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut and where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins you remit, they're remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Unlike Jesus and these apostles and disciples, we have not been invested with the powers of the Holy Spirit. We certainly do not have the authority to forgive sins against God. The forgiveness that is provisionally recommended for considering refellowshipping from those from whom fellowship has been ecclesially withdrawn is their sin against the ecclesia, not their sin against God. When a member of the Ecclesia is responsible for a very public sin against God and refuses to repent, refuses to change their behavior, that does not just constitute a sin against God. That also constitutes as a sin or a trespass against the Ecclesia. Because that unrepentant attitude is an Ecclesial decay accelerator. 
It is as Paul declares, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Therefore, he commanded them to remove that leaven so that the ecclesia could be an unleavened lump. We do not have the authority to forgive sins against God, but we do have the authority to forgive sins against ourselves and the ecclesia. Oh, we're going to take another one of those side notes in reference to an issue, issue that agitates me rather significantly. Let's look at that timestamp for this event in John 20. We are specifically told that Jesus appeared to the disciples following his resurrection when it was the evening of the first day of the week. That means Sunday evening. They had been eating their evening meal of broiled fish and honeycomb. Luke explains how he shows them his hands and feet and that the two disciples he had revealed himself to in Emmaus had quickly returned and were among them in Luke's account of the same exact incident. Sunday evening is just after Sabbath day has ended in the Jewish structure of the day. Long before the dawn of the first day of the week, that all of paganized Christianity, and sadly most Christadelphians, mistakenly believed that Jesus was resurrected. Many hours after he's appearing to these disciples during their Sunday evening meal. The Jewish day was designed after the creational pattern. First night, completely, and then day. Not like the Roman design that we suffer with today that so appropriately begins and ends in total darkness. We have two nights to every day. Jesus had already been alive again for hours by what we, re what we refer to at this time as Saturday evening. And the Bible understands to be the beginning of Sunday, just after the Sabbath sunset. The bottom line in all this is that Jesus was not mistaken or foolish or lying when he declared that he would be dead for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Just as a side note, another side note, the Jewish calendar for the year 30 of the Common Era, the year that Jesus died and rose again, Passover, that 14th day of Nisan, was on a Wednesday, not a Friday, which would contradict John's record of Christ appearing alive on, on Sunday night, just after uh, sunset on Saturday, many hours before sunrise, and it would also contradict the angel's testimony in Matthew 28 to the women about how Jesus was already risen before that Sabbath had ended, and also contradict Christ's own testimony that he would be dead for three days and three nights, shadow prophesying of the three full divine days under which all of creation would continue to suffer under the condemnation of death for those three millenniums, those 3,000 years. Although this isn't really our subject at the moment, I just wanted to take a moment to defend the honor of our Messiah in his testimony about being dead for three days and three nights, and not two nights and a little more than one day, as is so commonly and highly inappropriately presumed our next class uh, will be in two weeks, necessarily, and we'll continue examining this forgiveness limitation that we don't have the authority to forgive sins against God at this point in our Creator's plan, but we do have the authority to forgive sins against ourselves and against the Ecclesia. We'll then begin to consider that next forgiveness suggestion that if we do, don't completely forget a forgiven trespass against us, then we, we haven't truly forgiven, is that the divine pattern that we're expected to follow in our pursuit of the likeness of God?